Welcome to the program. I'm Tim Walker, pastor of Church Alive in Cleveland, Ohio, and it is such a joy to welcome you today. We have a tremendous panel of seasoned pastors from a variety of backgrounds that are here ready to answer your questions from a biblical perspective. So I want to encourage you to pick up the phone and call us 800-331-3552, or you can email us at ask at tct.tv. Now, I also want to remind you that we are live on YouTube. And so if you want to leave your questions on YouTube, they will come to us immediately as well. But whichever one you choose, we sure appreciate it. We look forward to hearing from you. We want to say a big thank you to Dr. Garth and Tina Kuntz for over 40 years of leading this great network with such vision and integrity. And thank you to everyone that prays for us and supports us with your generous financial gifts. Well, let's meet our pastors. First, we have Pastor Lavert Parker from Christ Community Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And next we have Dr. T. Wayne Bishop from ATWB Ministries in Columbus, Ohio. Also joining us today is Bishop James Delaney from St. James Christian Center in Columbus, Ohio. And then finally we have Pastor James Friedman from First Baptist Church of East Point in East Point, Michigan. Pastors, thank you for being with us and welcome to the program today. Before we start with our questions, I just want to encourage you to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, all the platforms, and we would love to connect with you. So look for us, get connected. We can't wait to hear from you. All right, pastors, our questions have already started coming in. And Pastor Parker, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, our first question is from Rhonda in Tennessee. And Rhonda wants to know about the gates of heaven. And here's her question. How many gates are there to go through to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And is there any scripture that would clarify that? Yeah, that, you know, that's actually a pretty interesting question. Uh, well, first off, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is not so much a reference to a place as it is to the rule and reign of God. Of course, you know that the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that God owns everything, that he's the king of all the universe. And so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, he's really talking about the recognized rule of God um, in the lives of his people. Uh, but it's also interesting because Jesus kind of addresses this in John chapter 10. Um, Jesus says that he's the door. Um, in John chapter 10 and verse number nine, Jesus says that I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so Jesus helps us understand in that particular verse that there's only one way into the kingdom of God, and that's through Christ. Jesus says in John 14 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So there may be multiple ways to Christ, but there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. And so he is the way to the kingdom. Thank you, Pastor Parker. And, and, and Dr. Bishop, let me, um, let me kind of interpret this question. Maybe the caller was asking something a little different. You know, the, the, the Bible talks about the New Jerusalem, and it talks about a city with 12 foundations, and um, it talks about uh, different gates. So when we talk about the New Jerusalem, let's, let's go that direction. Uh, are there multiple gates into the New Jerusalem? Are those type and shadows? Are those actual entrances? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think uh, it's more types and shadows, as, as you've mentioned, rather than uh, being literal or specific. Uh, the whole idea about the kingdom and uh, is more uh, talking about a realm than a building or a location or an actual city city, but always make reference to that. And there are a lot of these areas that the Bible are not very specific about. So a lot of it has to be interpreted within the context of the very particular verse or chapter or book where it was mentioned, because in a lot of times, different things are mentioned about the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Uh, in, in a different context and therefore must be interpreted within the same. I think um, uh, sometimes we try to get all exact and specific about these things. Uh, that's why I value uh, Pastor Parker's response that, that if, if Jesus is the way 
to uh, heaven. And, and we get there by going through him. And that's really the door, so to speak. And that means obviously spiritually and theologically. But um, there's not a lot that, that it talks about gates and entrances that need to be interpreted in a very practical or an actual door or gate necessarily. Thank you so much. And um, um, B- Bishop Delaney, talk to us a little bit about the kingdom of God. And uh, as Pastor Parker and as Dr. Bishop has said, the only way to enter the kingdom of God is through Jesus. So, you know, talk to us about the kingdom of God and then explain to the people that are watching how they can become part of the kingdom, how, that, how, how, how they can engage with the kingdom of God. A- absolutely. Which actually, uh, Apostle and uh, Pastor Parker, Apostle Bishop had already mentioned it, and Pastor Parker had already mentioned it as well. I'm going to go to the scripture, John 3 and 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that means you got to have faith in the resurrection, in, in, in the resurrection, in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And there's really only one way uh, to get to God. And then if you go back to the question that you were just mentioned about the 12 gates, the new Jerusalem, you know, it's a concept. It's uh, uh, it's in the second coming of Christ. New Jerusalem comes down from heaven and becomes this earthly capital that God creates um, an opportunity for us, for humanity to commune with him. And there are 12 of those gates in the new Jerusalem and each gate is built out of one big pearl. And you can go over, I believe it's over Revelations chapter 21. But but to before we ever get to see in the new Jerusalem, we got to be saved first. We got to get the, you know, understand that whole, that concept of, uh, of, of being saved and being born again as a Christian. All right. Thank you, pastors. I sure appreciate your answers. And Rania, I hope um, that that answered your question. Um, pa- Pastor Friedman, our next question is from Rob, who calls in from North Carolina. And Rob wants to know, and a lot of folks are asking this question about the COVID-19 vaccine. And his question is, is, If the vaccine changes our DNA, what does this mean for our earthly and heavenly bodies? And should we pray before we take the vaccine? Uh, Pastor Tim and and to uh, Rob, that is a very, very interesting question. And as you said, Pastor Tim, I'm sure there's many, many people. I know some in the church that I'm blessed with, Pastor, who have those same uh, questions as far as is, is it spiritually okay for us to do so? Uh, the answer to the question, first of all, I don't need a Big Mac without praying for it. So, <laughs> everything, everything from the cup of water to the Pepsi, everything needs to be prayed for. As far as I, if I'm listening to the question in, in the spirit of the question, uh, by taking this vaccination, is it going to somehow uh, disrupt the flow of our earthly tabernacle and its transition to the spiritual then my, my question, my answer would have to be no. Uh, I think any, we've been taking vaccinations. Uh, we talked about that earlier for years. I remember uh, at, at the time I was in school, uh, elementary school, high school, uh, uh, middle school, you had to take a number of different vaccinations. And A, we have the shingle vaccination, and the flu vaccination that many, many people, including Christians, uh, take. I think the concern of uh, the new vaccination uh, for COVID-19 is because it's new and uh, those types of things. And I don't think that it has any variance on our DNA anyway, but to soothe the mind of Rob and others who might be worrying that somehow this is going to interfere uh, with the cut catching away or their spiritual new body, I, I have to just hold on Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, where the Bible says, if the earthly house of this tabernacle shall be dissolved, hallelujah, we have a brand new body built in heaven. So it doesn't matter what happens here anyway. Uh, as you, if you are a Christian, that's what, I'm so blessed to be on this uh, panel with these wonderful men of God that just blessed my soul with that last answer up to the last question. If you're a Christian and you trust in the Lord and you believe in God, there's nothing that's going to happen here that's going to interfere with what we call the rapture of the church. Every one of us are going to receive a new body. Uh, thank, the decision to take the vaccination is a person. Uh, thank you, Pastor Freeman. Uh, pa- Pastor Parker, let me let me put a little different take on the question. Um, a lot of people are 
afraid to take the vaccine. Some think it may be the mark of the beast, as the, the caller uh, has called in, fear that it might change a person's DNA. You know, help us out. Talk to us about the vaccine. Is this something we ought to be afraid of? Um, you know, there's so much information, misinformation, false information. I think people don't know what to think. So help us out. Well, you know, I think ultimately, um, when we understand this in the bigger scheme of things, um, that sin has much more of a damaging impact on our body um, than any vaccine or anything that we put into our bodies. Um, I think about when Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees uh, because he and his disciples ate food without washing their hands first. And Jesus had to remind them that what goes in the body does not contaminate you, right? It doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of the heart that defiles you and contaminates you. And so um, I think that principle, I think, is applicable on some level as it relates to the vaccine and as it relates to our glorified bodies, um, that vaccine is not going to impact uh, what God has in store for us. If Christ has overcome sin, death, hell, and the grave, there is no virus or vaccine that's going to impact the glorified body that he's going to give to us. So I would say we should not fear. We got a hope that's well-founded in the scriptures, and uh, we shouldn't fear whatever the, this is going to happen to this earthly tent, like Pastor Freeman said, is going to the ground anyway, and we're going to be raised imperishable, immortal, um, and with the Lord forever. So uh, thank you, Pastor Parker and Pastor Friedman. I sure do appreciate you taking the time to answer that question. Uh, Dr. Bishop, our next question is from Renee in Texas. Renee, thank you so much for sending your question to us. And Renee wants to know, is all sin the same? Does the Bible say that all sin is the same? If so, how can this be? And can you give us scripture to substantiate one way or the other? Hmm. Well, to, to get a better handle on this, we've got to really clear up a number of things. First of all, sin is plural. So all that is committed is sin. We call that sin. So you that really, even though we say it a lot and many pastors say it, there's no such thing. As, sin cannot be described as big sin or little sin. Sin is Sin, the plural, mean all varying different types of sin. But I, I do understand uh, where uh, Renee is going with this, and I'll say this. There are, however, there is, however, the different methods in which we commit sin. There are sins of the body. There are sins of the spirit. And these carry far more consequences than others. And uh, I can explain it to you a little better this way. A person takes a life and that they killed an individual. Now, the one man says, I've got a gun at home. I'm going home, get my gun, come back, and then I'm going to shoot you in the head. Premeditated murder. That's what it is called in our justice system. Another person uh, uh, engaged in a fight on the street and they're fighting. And one person uh, takes up a, a, an object and hits the other over his head and he dies. They both die. That's called manslaughter. And then there's another situation where someone uh, uh, might be uh, at home sleeping and someone breaks in their house and in defending themselves, get the gun, shoot the man, and he dies. That's called self-defense. Now, all three cases, someone died. But it is treated differently. Premeditated murder uh, is, is what we call murder one. Manslaughter, the different level, and the punishment is different. And then uh, self-defense, uh, you, you, uh, there's no charge for that. You, you probably walk away from it uh, uh, free and clear. In the same way that there are different degrees of how uh, uh, these murders came about, there are different ways we sin. And some things are more are more. Uh, carry more severe punishment than others. And the thing about sin is that God sees the heart because a lot of time the mo sin is driven by motives. We can't see what was in that person's heart. We don't know what they were thinking. We know the end result. Someone lost their life. But the thing about my father is that he knows the heart. So when he makes a judgment, he makes a judgment also on the heart and the motive of that individual. 
That's why in scripture, you see sometimes uh, um, God told uh, 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 Jonah go to Nineveh and he went the opposite direction. God sent a fish and, and swallowed him up, took him to Nineveh. God told the prophet, don't go back the same way to eat from anybody. He did, but yet a bear and a lion conspired to kill him. First time a bear and a lion ever got together to do anything. And so why, why was one killed and why was the other one spared? See, because God knows the heart. So uh, sin is everything is sin, but there are different degrees and different punishment by God based upon the, the, the heart of the person at the time when the error was committed. There are different ways and different degrees of that. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. And um, Bishop Delaney, I'm going to bring the question to you in just a moment. I want you to be thinking about it. Let's define what sin is. Let's talk about the effect and the effect uh, effect of sin. Uh, we're going to be right back after this. We got a lot to go, so don't don't leave. We'll be right back. Did you know TCT has a brand new app? That's right. You now have access to today's Christian television with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Enjoy TCT on all your favorite devices, whether at home or on the go. And just for signing up and downloading the new TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the new TCT app to get access to today's Christian television today. You ask the questions and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. Our production team at TCT works hard behind the scenes to produce these highly enriched programs. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. Jim from Florida calls in with this question. What are some Bible verses that can help with depression. Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. And you can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Also, you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. And we just want to remind you how important it is that you sow your most generous seed into this ministry. We're, we're so grateful for everyone that prays for us, that watches on a regular basis, and those that feel the tug of the Holy Spirit in their heart to connect with us to support this ministry. There's a variety of ways that you can give. You can mail your donations to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. You can also call us at 800-232-9855. Uh, you can go to our webpage, tct.tv. On the homepage, there's a give link. You can give right there. Or like I say regularly, if you're like me and you do everything on your cell phone, it's probably most convenient just to have your banking information and you can text to give. You can set it up for a one-time gift or a repeating gift and whichever uh, method that you choose, we're so grateful. We pray God blesses you and we want to say thank you for helping us reach souls. We are so grateful for your support. We also want to hear from you. We've still got a lot of time to go in today's program. We want to hear your questions. You can call us at 800-331-3552. You can email us at ask at tct.tv. Or remember, we are live on YouTube. And so if you go to YouTube and leave your questions there, they will be sent to us immediately and we'll present them to this tremendous panel of pastors that we have assembled today. Uh, so um, Bishop Delaney, I'm going to come to you with this question. I'm going to ask you to do it like this. I'm going to ask you, first of all, to define what sin is so we know really what we're talking about. And then secondly, talk to us about the effect of sin. You know, when we think about, uh, you know, the idea of all sins being equal, 
we know they're equal in the sense that God can forgive them and that we have all committed them. Uh, but to, to equate the, the murder of a person or the um, molesting of a child with a person that tells a lie would really seem to demean the nature and character of God. Uh, you know, so talk to us, explain to us the difference in the effects of sin on us individually and maybe on a society in general. Absolutely. Let, let's go with that definition of sin, or at least let me go with what the Word of God says about sin. Romans 6.23, King James Version says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. James 4.17, King James Version says this, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's a great definition right there of what sin is. Let me read that again. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and do it that not to him it is sin. And then we got 1 John 3 and 4, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. You know, sin has a, a huge impact um, on our lives. You know, you can't unsee and undo different things. You can't unsee pornography. You can't undo some of the bad things you, you've done. You got to ask for forgiveness and move forward. What we have to do is, well, let me say this. How you act in the wilderness is how you're going to act in the promised land. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is understand that we've got to be transformed. We got to, as Christians, we got to allow the word of God to transform us from sin the same way the phone booth transformed Clint Clark Kent to Superman. We got to be transformed. And that comes by a, a renewing of our mind. So we got to understand God's not taking application. He's only taking commitments. Commit to do the right thing in life. And really, everything else works out works out fine for you, in my opinion. Th thank you, Bishop Delaney. I sure appreciate that. And uh, Renee, thank you for your question. Uh, Pastor Friedman, our next question comes from Mackenzie in the great state of North Carolina. And she wants to know about the assurance of God's love. And here's her question. How can we have assurance that God loves us? Amen. Uh, great question. Uh, Bishop Delaney, that's the first time I've heard Clark Kent and Superman mentioned it. <laughs> but the assurance of God's love is, is very, very simple. And that is in St. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, shall not perish, but should have everlasting life. It is by faith that we received our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is by faith, by receiving him as our Lord and our Savior, that the love of God covers us, surrounds us, and indwells us. Everything that comes to our Heavenly Father, because the scripture says in 1 John, God is love. The assurance of our Heavenly Father's love toward us is the fact that while we were yet sinners, the scripture goes even further and said, when we were enemies, God sent his son to die for you and I. It is the only reason we have access to our Heavenly Father right now. As Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but by him. That is the ultimate assurance, the love that our Heavenly Father has. Thank you, Pastor Freeman. And um, pa Pastor Parker, there are so many people that maybe because of issues that have happened in their lives, rejection, abuse, you know, they struggle feeling as though that they are loved, that they struggle accepting grace. They, they struggle accepting unconditional love from the Father. What, what can you say to that person that's really questioning and struggling with receiving the love of God for themselves? Well, you know, the beautiful thing is, and you pointed out, Pastor Tim, in, in your uh, question, is that we receive this by faith, and um, faith surpasses our feelings. And sometimes there's a disagreement between our feelings and um, and our faith. Uh, but praise God, we have the Word of God as confirmation um, that can help build and feed our faith. And what Pastor Freeman just communicated to us was that we have scriptures in the Bible that assures us um, that God loves us. And not only do they assure us that God loves us, but it actually communicates how God demonstrated his love. Um, anytime you question God's love for us, always look back at the cross. Um, the cross is a symbol 
is a reminder that God loves us so much, as Pastor Freeman brought up, uh, that he sent his son to die for us. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, than for one to lay down his life for another. And so I would encourage that person uh, to meditate, meditate on those scriptures. Uh, think about John 316, meditate on that, meditate on Romans chapter five. Um, it talks about how God demonstrated his love for us. Uh, meditate on first John chapter three, that says that God has showered us. God has lavished us with his love. He's made us his children. Um, and, um, and I would encourage that person to feed your faith by meditating and reflecting and contemplating on the word of God. Thank you, Pastor Parker. And and Dr. Bishop, the reality is, as a person that struggles to receive God's love, probably struggles to receive love from any person. And so would you just take a moment and maybe talk to that individual that's watching us right now that really feels unloved, unimportant, as though their life doesn't matter? Would you just take a moment and just, just talk to that person and speak directly to their heart today? Oftentimes, we tend to judge our Heavenly Father's relationship to us and how He feels about us based upon our earthly relationships, because we don't have any other measurement but that. Most of the time, you had a lousy earthly father. You look at God in terms of Heavenly Father as as lousy as well. But I want to assure you that God is not like Um, our earthly father. He's not like any human being. God's love is unconditional. Somebody once said that he who knows us best love us the most. And while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. You are loved by God. The fact that you're still here, you got up this morning, you had breath in your lungs, this symbolizes God's love for you. I dare you to get close to God and you will literally feel his arms around your life of compassion and of comfort. I've walked with the Lord for over 40 years of my life. And I can tell you, there are many times I didn't understand what he was doing. The many times that I didn't know how a thing was going to work out. But when I look back on every last one of those situations today, one common thread remains. He'd been there loving me through it all and all the time. And you were no different. Father would love you and care for you and take care of you. Give him a chance. Don't treat him. Don't measure him by other relationships in your life. He is a God all by himself. David said, and I close to saying this to you, taste and see that the Lord is good. You are loved. Christ loved you. And I love you too. So be good and know that it's going to get better. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mackenzie, we sure do appreciate uh, your question. And um, thank you for calling in from North Carolina. Uh, Bishop Delaney, uh, our next question is one that we actually get uh, periodically here that a lot of people have this concern in their heart. They love their pets. They love their animals. And we have an anonymous caller that wants to know, will our pets be in heaven? Yeah, that that anonymous caller never wants to admit asking these questions. <laughs> you know, this is one of those questions where I certainly hope pets get to heaven because I got a couple of dogs I want to see, you know, uh, Max and Kelly, and I want to see them when I get to heaven. But um, we really don't know the answer. We, we really can't say for certain that um, we will see our pets or our dogs, so to speak, uh, in heaven. But but let me, let me say this. We know we're going to see some animals because the Bible says over in Genesis 1, 24 through 25, King James Version, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So we know that animals were in the garden. Do we know that
that our dogs and our pet fish and all of them are if they're gonna make it to heaven we really don't know i would like like i said i'm hoping i you know i, I want to see max again i remember when i took him to the vet you know and, and for the last time we had to put him down such a horrible day uh because our dogs and our pets they become a part of the family so i i, I would like to see max in that resurrected body but we don't know we don't know <laughs> Thank, thank you, Bishop. And, you know, Pastor Friedman, I have a little dog that's 17 years old and has been part of our family since uh, he was just a tiny little puppy. And, you know, I know how my kids feel about him. I know how I feel about him. And as Bishop Delaney said, they literally become part of our family. Uh, you know, talk to us about that. What are, what are your thoughts? Will, will there be pets in heaven or will our pets be in heaven? Hey, Amen. Thank you so much. Bishop Delaney, you did a great job. I think all of us are all of us uh, here today are animal lovers. I know uh, I certainly am, and uh, as, as it's already been established by Bishop Delaney here, scripturally, uh, when we read throughout Genesis to Revelation, uh, we find uh, animals existing uh, in the kingdom of God in heaven. Uh, the scriptures, even in Revelation, talks about the horses and. Things such as that, and and so we 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 can we can establish that. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I, I feel like Bishop Delaney. I, I would hope so, but uh, I like cats. Prince Oliver's. You know, when we put him down, it was like one of our kids. But I really don't believe the scriptures gives us enough information to definitive definitively answer that to say uh, yay or nay. I, I would have to lean more toward the no in this question. But we just don't have enough uh, uh, enough scriptures to substantiate either or. Uh, I have a hope, like Bishop Delaney just said. But uh, if I don't see Prince Oliver in heaven, I'm going to thank God for the moment he's, he shared with us in our lives. And I'd be grateful that uh, we took care of him and showed him love uh, at that time. And I think that goes for any, and I apologize if I'm going a little long, but I think, that, I think it's important. But I think that goes for any of us that we need to shower the people that God has blessed us, including our pets, with as much love as we can right now uh, while we're here in this three-dimensional reality. Thank you, pastors. And uh, to our caller, we sure do appreciate that. We don't know if they're going to be in heaven or not, but we sure know they bring a lot of heaven to earth. So love them and celebrate them. And hopefully, maybe one day, we will be re reunited with them in heaven. Um, but we really don't know for sure. Uh, pa Pastor Parker... We have another question that has come in from Betty in New York. Always good to hear from the state of New York. And Betty's question is about living a life of happiness. And she says, how can we live the life of happiness daily, even when things go wrong? And can you give us some scripture for that? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I actually have a couple of thoughts about that. Uh, first off, the Beatitudes um, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 um, well, what the Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and Jesus talks specifically about the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, uh, the blessed ours. Uh, that word blessed there actually means happy. And so there's a sense in which Jesus says as we walk out those values that he communicates in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we can have a happy life. Um, but I think on a broader scale, I think what the Bible promises us is joy. And my understanding of joy is that it's much deeper, much richer um, than happiness, because joy is about an inner peace um, in, in every season of life, but particularly when you're going through things. And it's interesting that in two portions of scriptures, the Bible talks about joy in the context of suffering. Uh, Romans chapter 5, um, the Apostle Paul, Romans 5, verse 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says that he can rejoice in his suffering because he knows that suffering produces endurance and character and so forth. And then James says something very similar in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, when he says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you go through various trials, because the testing of your faith, because you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and so forth. And so I will say what the Bible promises us is joy. And I so appreciate joy um, because it's that inner peace, especially in the, in the context of, a suffering and our joy is not based on how we feel, but it's based on what we know. 
And so in both of those portions of scriptures, it says that we can have joy because we know in the midst of our suffering that God is working something out for our good and for his glory. So I will say to Betty um, that certainly the, God, the Bible promises us joy, and that joy is rooted in the hope that we have that God is working in our lives to bring about something good and something for his glory. Thank you, uh, Pastor Parker. And uh, D- Dr. Bishop, um, Pastor Parker quoted that verse from Hebrews chapter 1, count it all joy when you find yourself, in, when you find yourself involved in all kinds of problems. You know, if indeed, as most theologians believe that that was the first verse of the New Testament, that, that the book of James was the first book chronologically written, and the message, the first message that God sends to the church is count it all joy when you find yourself involved in all kinds of difficulties. What can we do as Christians to respond? Because, I, I mean, let's be honest, it's not easy to count it all joy when you feel like you're overwhelmed by problems. So how do we respond and how do we find joy in the time of suffering and heartache? Well, you know, first of all, let me be very honest with you with that and, and with, uh, with our, uh, the one who's asking the question. Your ability to count it all joy in a difficult situation is directly connected to the depth of your relationship with God. I think the more intimate you are with Christ and the more uh, of your life that's given to him and, and, and he controls your life is the more, the easier it is to uh, express joy and worship in the mix of difficult situations when you're not living, you're not fully dedic- dedicated to him and, and difficulty comes, you always find yourself doubting and tripping because you don't have a specific anchor. And a lot of people tend to believe that all Christians are created equal, but that's not true. Based upon your time spent with God and based upon your journey with God, your devoutness, the the way you live a God first mentality gives you the strength to activate joy in the mix of difficult situations. And you can do it because you've been through enough in your past to know that he brought you to that. So he's very well able to bring you to this. And also another flip side of that coin real quickly is that sometimes if, if the trouble you go through is the result of your own lack of wisdom, your own sin and own error, you may not be able to find much joy there. But a lot of this joy the Bible speaks about is when stuff come at you from demonic origins, from wicked human spirits, another thing that you look at it and understand that God is able to bring you out and to take you through this. So our the depth of our ability to respond to joy in a difficult situation is really dependent upon the depth of our commitment and daily walk with Christ. Thank you, pastors. And uh, thank you so much, Betty, for your question. And uh, Pastor Friedman, I'm going to come to you with the next question about different beliefs. And if all the churches have different beliefs, how can we all be doing the will of God? I can't wait to hear the answer. We'll be right back right after this. Did you know TCT has a brand new app? That's right. You now have access to today's Christian television with one simple click. Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Enjoy TCT on all your favorite devices, whether at home or on the go. And just for signing up and downloading the new TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to TCT.TV, ways to watch, apps and devices to get started. Download the new TCT app to get access to today's Christian television today. 
You ask the questions and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. Our production team at TCT works hard behind the scenes to produce these highly enriched programs. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. Jim from Florida calls in with this question. What are some Bible verses that can help with depression? Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. And you can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Also, you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. And I just want to encourage you to prayerfully consider sowing your most generous gift today. You know, TCT is broadcasting on a variety of platforms. We're reaching out to people with the gospel of Jesus Christ seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And we do it because you have partnered with us, and that's what makes it possible. So I want to encourage you, prayerfully consider sowing your most generous gift. You can send it to TCT PO Box 1010 Marion, Illinois, 62959. You can pick up the phone and call us 800-232-9855. And there will be a sponsor on the other side of that phone that will receive your donation. You can also go to our website, tct.tv. On the home on the home page, there's a give link. You can give right there. Or you can text to give, and all that information is there on your screen. And we just want to say how grateful we are and how much we appreciate it. We also want to connect with you on social media. Look for us on faith on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Pinterest and all the other social media formats. We want to get connected with you. Well, we still have time for your question today. And so if you haven't set that, sent that question in, make sure you do that. You can send it to us at ask at tct.tv. You can call us. The information is there on your screen. And these pastors are waiting to answer your questions and tell you what the Bible says about what is heavy on your heart. Well, our, our question is, uh, Pastor Friedman, uh, if some churches have different beliefs, how can we all be doing the will of God? So, so let me rephrase that. If, if we have all these different churches and you know, some people believe one thing, some people believe something else, how can we all be doing the will of God? Amen. Boy, and I want to I want to say thank you so much for this question. It is a question growing up in church as I I the Lord has blessed me being in church or in the church in me for 52 years. At some point of time in my life, my Christian experience, I had that same question. So I decided to do some study on it and uh so that I could have peace of mind when it came to uh this dilemma that we have and what you're really talking about are uh, the different doctrines from church to church that exists, even from organization to organization, is we get into denominationalism. And uh, we find that even in the Bible, when we look at the book of Acts, when we look at the book of Romans, the Pauline epistles, they had the same issue. And uh, this is why we had so many letters uh, that were written by uh, Paul and James and John dealing with this particular perspective. What has happened over the years, uh, because first of all, mankind got our hands on on uh, something that was so simple as the Bible said, uh, the word of God is so simple that a food need is not error. And uh, because of our personal opinions, our intentions, our goals, and our objectives, we've added, we've taken away uh, from the simplicity of the word of God, hence denominationalism. Uh, another fact that comes into play when we talk about the difference of doctrine is the uh, spiritual truths versus doctrine. Spiritual truth is Jesus Christ is Lord. That is undeniable. That is unde undebatable. Spiritual truth is our God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. That is undeniable. It's a sin to wear green is what we call a doctrine. So what has happened over the years is that many doctrines have become spiritual truths. Now, if you uh, to prove that point, all you have to do is just answer a question, put it on Google, and that's why shows like this one so important because we are giving you the unadulterated word of God, not our opinions 
and not what we think. This is one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul, who was dealing with the same issues, should I eat meat, should I not? Today it would be, is it okay to do this or do that, which would be a doctrine versus a spiritual truth. Paul put it this way when it comes to why so many differences, which is always going to happen. But Paul put it this way. I seek, as he said to the Church of Corinth, I seek to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I fellowship and worship with many people from, and they have different doctrines. Uh, don't wear green. Don't go to the movies. Don't watch TV. Uh, man should have long hair. You know, women can't do this. Or wear that. Those are doctrines. But as long as they teach and they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, I can fellowship with them. They're still teaching the word. They just have different, different doctrine. So it's important for you when you join a church or look at a church, even now, if that doctrine goes against the word of God, because everything is founded on the word of God, then you get your grip and run out of there. Jesus put it very, uh, the word of God puts it very simple. If a person is, or anybody is teaching another gospel, even an angel from heaven, then the one that is right now, and let that person be accursed. Everything that is being taught could be in the word, founded in the word of God. If it's not, that could be a doctrine. Okay? But the Bible speaks about one, one uh, number that bridges us all together. If we all believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, amen, then that one word, number of oneness, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Thank you, Pastor Freeman. And, uh, you know, Pastor Parker, down through history, people have grappled with this question. That's why we had, you know, the Council at Nicene. That's why we have the Apostles' Creed. So, so talk to us about what are the non-negotiables? What are, what are the things that cannot be, um, you know, fluid? What, what, what are the, the absolutes that our church must embrace to be a, a biblical church? Yeah, well, Pastor Friedman said, um, which I thought was really good, uh, that there are minors and there's majors, right? And we need to avoid majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. Uh, there are core beliefs that unify and define us as uh, people of God. And um, I would say the foundational truth that we cannot, um, we cannot compromise on, uh, that's bedrock to our faith, is who Jesus is. Um, the understanding that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. The understanding of salvation through Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved um, except through the name of Christ. And so as it relates to who Jesus is, who, as it relates to who God is and how to get right with God, that's what makes us distinct as believers. If somebody has a different Christ, and the Apostle Paul mentioned this in um, 2 Corinthians, if someone presents a different Christ and consequently a different gospel, then it's to be rejected because our faith is built upon, uh, certainly it's built upon teachings, but it's built upon a person, and that's the person of Christ. So we cannot, under no circumstances, compromise um, who Jesus is. And what we understand from the scriptures is it's that Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us. The word became flesh. He's the son of God who came on a mission to die for our sins. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to be with the father and he sent the church out on a mission to spread this good news to as many people as possible. That's what unifies us. That's what identifies us. And that's the bedrock to who we are. Thank you, Pastor Parker. And, and Dr. Bishop, I saw the other day, um, a church in Nashville that's advertising on social media that they do not believe the Bible is the word of God. They do not believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, they, they do not believe uh, uh, in a lot of the tenets of our faith that, that we have espoused as, as believers. So, so tell me what things are negotiable, what things are not negotiable. Um, you know, do we go back to the Apostles' Creed? What, what are, how, how do we know if, you know, as a person looking for a church, that is an authentic New Testament church, what things, um, you know, are non-negotiable? There are very few things that a wide cross-section of believers uh, are going to tell you um, 
is foundational and the bedrock. You got to believe this. The whole question of sin, forgiveness of sin, you got to be forgiven. You got to come through Christ to the Father. It's fundamental. Christ and him crucified is very, very fundamental. Uh, a church that, that doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God and Christ, that's not a church. That's a religious organization. That's not a church. And religion is the greatest enemy to the kingdom of God. Religion and tradition are the two greatest enemies to the kingdom. But let me let me throw something out there to you that, that in, in this format. There is, however, uh, a reality that not all of us uh, as believers are called to the same message to the world. Fundamentally, the kingdom, we are described as being the body of Christ. So if we look at that, the head, the hands, the feet, the elbow, shoulders, internal organs, external organs, whatsoever. If you have a conversation with my toe about its performance and what's important, it's going to, and have a conversation with my neck, they're not going to tell you the same things. Different functions, but yet it's the same body. There are parts of the world. I traveled to South Africa. I network there. They have a strong message in certain areas. There's not necessarily a strong message here in America, and it does not need to be. Believers and men of God and apostolic voices and prophetic voices around the world are not supposed to be saying the same thing. Now, this is not doctrine. I'm not talking necessarily about about. Uh, maybe I am talking about doctrine, according to uh, Pastor Friedman, great uh, analogy, uh, doctrine versus um, uh, uh, core beliefs. But we say different things because different parts of the body need different messages at different times. And that's why you can have churches that believe some different things, but yet we still belong to Christ. And let me say this before I'm finished as well. What divides us between each other does not necessarily divide us from God. And we could have different opinions between us, but it does not necessarily divide uh, us from God necessarily. So the idea here is that until Christ comes, people are going to believe differently. I think Fundamentally, we're going to find something between all of us here on this program today that may slightly be different. Uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Bishop Delaney said earlier, he hoped his pet Bruno and Max may get to heaven, and 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 Pastor Freeman feel the same way. I, I understand. I don't like pets. I don't have pets. I don't have the same interest. I don't think pets going to be to heaven. Jesus didn't die for Bruno, and he didn't die for Max. But that that's inconsequential my calling and their calling and their message. We serve together. We love together. We yeah. do things together. Don't let the slight difference, watch, don't wash feet. Uh, 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 some people say baptized in Jesus' name. Some people say Father and the Holy Ghost. It will make no difference at the end of the day. Fundamentally, Thank Christ and Him crucified. You Thank right, you so much. You heaven, you don't live right. You're going to spread I appreciate right that. Over. And uh, Dr. Bishop, what a tremendous answer. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Bishop Delaney, we have a question that just came in on YouTube. And uh, the poster wants to know, in the end times, will we still be judged even if we are saved? If, w will Christians be judged in the end hmm. uh, just like the unbeliever? Yeah, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. We're going to get judged on the works that we've done on this earth. We're going to get judged whether or not we've given our lives uh, to Christ, whether we said, Lord, forgive me for all my sins and uh, repented of our sins. And if we believed in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we're all going to be judged on that. And it's better to get it right and get it all taken. Well, you got to get it right and get it taken care of right now. But it's better just to do the right things right now. Um, and so you'll be judged the right way once Christ or when Christ comes back. But yes, we're all going to be judged, every last one of us. Uh, thank you, Bishop. And, um, you know, Pastor Friedman, I think a lot of times people get confused between the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. Um, can you take a moment and just address that for us as our program comes to an end today? Sure. Well, the one is uh, the judgment is the uh, questioner was asking for to see if you get it to heaven or not. Well done, thou good and faithful servant versus 
depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. The other one, the apostle Paul talked about, which was the judgment that Bishop Delaney said, which was the judgment of works. Those are for Christians. And you, you'll hear in Paul's writing, he said, though you be saved, your works might be burned because you did it with the wrong intention or with the wrong purpose. God doesn't care about uh, the quality of anything, but he does care about, I mean, the quantity of anything, but he does care about the quality of what we do, the intention of Thank, thank you, pastors. And we're so grateful for all of the questions that came in today. And just I want to remind you, if we didn't get to your question, don't go anywhere. Keep watching. We will get to it in a future program. And so remember, keep watching. Ask the pastor. Keep watching TCT. You can send your questions to us at 800-331-3552. You can email them at ask at tct.tv. Or you can go to YouTube. We are live on YouTube during this program. You can leave your questions right there. And as you saw today, those questions will get to us. We'll present them to our pastors and they'll give us answers from a biblical perspective. Well, I want to thank each of the pastors. And we had some really interesting questions today and some tremendous answers. Pastors, you're so grateful or we are so grateful for your grace and your wisdom. Thank you so much for investing this time in us. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for the TCT network. Keep watching us. In fact, I encourage you just to set your channel to TCT and don't go anywhere because it's 24 hour broadcasting on a variety of different levels and different formats that's designed to minister to the whole family. So just set your channel right on TCT and don't go anywhere. Let us minister to you. Don't be, uh, don't forget rather to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Pinterest and continually TCT is posting things that will encourage you. It will brighten your day. It'll be a blessing to you. It'll also give you an opportunity to get to know us a little bit. It'll give us an opportunity to get to know you. So look for us on all of these different uh, social formats and let's get Connect it. Finally, I want to encourage you to support this program with your generous financial gifts. That information is there on your screen. You can send it to TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. You can go to our website, tct.tv. You can call us, 800 232 9855, or you can text to give, and that information is there on your screen. I want to thank you for watching today, and remember, next time you have a question, want to know what the Bible says says about it, ask the pastor. Can't wait to see you next time. Have a wonderful afternoon. Ask the Pastor is a TCT network production and is made possible by your financial gifts. If you have questions or comments, write Ask the Pastor, PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois 62959 or email us at ask at tct.tv. Thanks for watching.